So now that we understand the basics of the absorption spectrum, why should we care? In other words, what does this information tell us? Now, without going into some very detailed and technical uh, chemical information that would be the subject of an upper level college course, uh, something very simple and very everyday that we can think about is that the absorption of a compound actually determines its color. So for those of you who like things to have color, uh, you can thank absorbance. Now, how does this play out? If you look at our spectrum on the far right, over here I have three spectra overlaid. Uh, this first one is going to absorb between 600 and 700 nanometers. Now that's absorbing what we would typically consider orange and red light. Now, before you think, okay, so that thing should be orange and red, remember that that means that those colors are absent. So when your light looks at this compound, it perceives all of the colors except orange and red light. Thus, we end up with something that's kind of a bluish green, which is going to be the complements of orange and red. If you need to review your complementary colors, uh, go back to your art class or uh, simply work, look up a visible absorption spectrum color wheel or something like that. Our second compound here absorbs mainly around 650 nanometers. Uh, some at 600 as well. Now that's absorbing basically orange light. Thus, it appears blue, the complement of orange. Note, of course, the contrast between these two colors. One appears blue because it is absorbing basically just orange light. The other appears bluish green because it's absorbing orange light plus a little bit of the red light as well. Our final spectrum then is the spectrum that we showed you initially, that's that deep purple compound. Now, if you remember your color wheel, the complement of purple is yellow, and this is exactly what we would call yellow light. So this is absorbing mainly in the region of yellow light and thus appears purple, the complementary color of yellow. Now, before we get to interested in this, I'd like to show you this vial. This vial is of course colorless and in fact uh, simply contains the solvent acetone. So if you've ever used nail polish remover, you should be fairly familiar with this. This does absorb light. However, it only absorbs light at wavelengths that are imperceptible to the human eye. And since the colors that we can see all pass through this sample, we perceive white light hence it appears colorless. So that's just a basic overview of what UV vis absorption can tell you. Uh, there's a lot more detail to this, but this is a general introduction to the topic of ultraviolet visible spectroscopy. Thank you. It's important, if at all possible, to ensure that your sample contains uh, just one pure substance. Now, the reason for this can be demonstrated with the spectra you see on the slide in front of you. As you can see, we've taken uh, two different species. Their spectra are given here in red and in blue. And then a third sample has been taken, which is simply a mixture of the two compounds in a random amounts, and that is given in purple. Now, the, what is immediately apparent is, of course, that it's not simply the two spectra side by side, right? Because these two spectrum overlap, we have um, a shift in the total absorbance. So one of the most important things to note is that the lambda max value is not the same as the two individual components. So in red, our lambda max is about 578, that's compound two. In blue, our lambda max is about 650 nanometers, that's compound one. And then if we look at the mixture of the two, we see a maximum at about 580, which is kind of close to compound two, uh, but not exactly. And then we can't identify the maximum for the other species, although it looks to be around 620 nanometers. So the reason for this is that when we have a mixture of the two compounds, the spectrum that we obtain is a weighted average of the spectra of each component. Now you can deconvolute this, however, that is difficult. Um, and it becomes increasingly difficult as you have 
more and more components. So when we're taking a UV vis spectrum, it's best to try, if at all possible, to simply isolate one pure component and take the individual spectrum of that species.